Welcome back to the Powered Up Coaches Show, sponsored by Sideline Power, your number one choice for coaching communications and all things sports tech related. If you're new to the program, the Powered Up Coaches Show goes beyond the X's and O's and really delves into why coaches do what they do. How does a coach create winning seasons year after year after year? In this week's episode, host Tim Washburn sits down with head coach of Flatview High School, Mark McLaughlin, and they really delve into what it looks like to truly commit yourself to your program. How do you get out in the community and build those relationships that in turn build your program? Why it's important to have your high school athletes out coaching youth programs? And how do you go from 14 points an entire season, an entire season, only 14 points, and you turn that around and you come back and you make a team that is tough and consistent? It's a really great program, so stay tuned and stay powered up. Well, now listen, I love, I absolutely love starting with uh, when you're a youth and where you grew up and all these backyard football games. But yeah. I get to talk with Platteview head coach Mark McLaughlin about some backyard football games that happened sure. as a kid in Elkhorn, Nebraska. And you went up against the likes of a Nebraska tight end when you're a little guy. Um, your backyard games were against Phil Peets, who was yep. a Nebraska tight end. Back in the late 90s, these were no normal backyard no. football games, were they? Tell no. me about them. Uh, before the era of every kid has a cell phone and you're, you know, playing video games or running around all the time, we're outside. And I had a brother that was in Phil Pizza's class, class of 99. And we'd get a neighborhood game of backyard football going, especially when it snowed. That was the best. Snow football. Oh, um, yeah. And put the spotlights on the deck and play, in the, play in the, under the lights. But... Phil Peets goes to Nebraska, plays tight end. For Elkhorn, he was an offensive lineman, um, state runner-up, heavyweight wrestler. Uh, playing playing backyard football against him, he's four years older than me. But uh, And you'd put your head right in. You guys were uh, playing tackle. And oh, you'd yeah. you put your head right in there. Well, the, there's no tackling Phil Peets. But <laughs> we played tackle, and yeah. Oh, those had to be great. You know, that's the one thing I love. You grew up in Elkhorn, and... Yep. Elkhorn looks, I think, a lot different today than it probably did back when you were a kid. So when you were a kid, was it that, that smallish community that you could still ride yeah. your bike around and get oh, yeah. to the park? Tell me a little yeah. bit about what, what um, it was like growing up in Elkhorn. There was three elementary schools, Skyline, Westridge, and Hillrise, one middle school. And we actually, when I was a kid, they played their high school football games at the middle school. Uh, and then and then one high school, which now we call it Elkhorn Classic. So whenever we talk um, to, to people about Elkhorn, they ask which one we went to. We say classic. I like that. Yeah. That's a nice moniker for the um, original Elkhorn. It is. High, right? It's the original. But, you know, you drive down Highway 31 now from Gretna to to the north side of Elkhorn, getting into Bennington and stuff. And there's there's everything you can imagine in terms of restaurants. Uh, but back in 2002 and before there was an Arby's in town and a subway downtown uh, a little ice cream shop and that was about it so it's it's blown up yeah and it was still the little historic downtown oh, yeah. right that yes. was considered downtown so where and did you guys play football where, where would you guys find a place our games uh and I'm talking oh, about backyard kid, okay backyard so stuff. I grew up on the outskirts of Elkhorn on Pacific and we had a neighborhood, Rogers Ridge, which was a developing neighborhood. So there were vacant lots all over the place. Now you might get tackled on a on a staple or a rock or something, <laughs> but man, that's you have to toughen up. That's that's part of it. So yeah. we we just played in in the in the construction lots and stuff like that. Oh man, you guys were tough. Yeah, going well, in the construction lots. Yeah. You know, everyone we all I'm sure Nebraska played a huge role, especially oh, yeah. in the '90s, but. I always remember wearing the NFL gear, too. Yep. You know, the NFL stocking caps and the NFL jerseys and all of that. What was your team? I'm an Eagles fan. Oh, man. I'm a Cowboys which fan. I've, uh, a long yeah. <laughs> well, we've, had, we've shared equal heartache in yeah. terms of, of not getting the job done. The, there was a stretch, uh, late high school, early college, where the Eagles were the Buffalo Bills of the NFL. We'd go to the NFC Championship game every year and could never get out. Um, but yeah, Randall Cunningham, when I was a little kid, again, 1980s, uh, Nintendo had Tecmo Super Bowl and Randall Cunningham was the only guy in the game that wouldn't give Tecmo Super Bowl his name. So everybody's name's in there except QB Eagles, it says. 
So that's kind of how I became an Eagles fan. I love it. And then you had to endure the Fog Bowl against yep. the Bears in a huge yes. playoff game. You yeah. remember that oh, one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the Eagles lose that one, right? Or did you uh, end up winning that game? Was that the same game that the kicker hit the upright twice? Oh, boy. I just remember trying to watch it on TV. You couldn't see no. a player. No. It was unbelievable. No. Uh, um, but they somehow played it. Yep. <laughs> a little different now. Yeah. I don't know that that game gets played today. I agree. But, a little more at stake. Yeah. So you talked about the days before cell phones yep. and the days before, you know, all these video games. Were you the kind of kid that would watch a football game or were you the kind of kid that said, listen, I love football, but I'm going to be outside playing it and I'm going to miss a lot of football on TV because I'm out. I'm always outside. What we, what we did a lot of times is we would – we would have a backyard football game going, and we would play during commercial breaks. So we, one offense would go out and get a series in during a commercial break, and then we'd all run inside. And um, you probably remember Nebraska played played uh, Iowa State one year. We got beat. It was yes. like 1992. One of the few upsets yeah. that Osborne ever went yeah. through. I remember watching that game, or maybe we were listening to it on the Kent Pavelka broadcast, but – between series, we'd go out and and crank a series of offense or defense out in our little backyard game, and then we'd all sit down and tune back into the Husker game. So we kind of did a little bit of both. We'd watch, listen, and play. Uh, and then in, in the winter time and spring, we'd do the same thing in March Madness. They'd be revealing the bracket, and between brackets or regionals, we'd run outside and play a game of 21 or whatever and then go back inside so that we didn't miss anything. So football, basketball, were you a baseball kid too? Baseball. Yeah. And I was definitely not a basketball kid. I just played. That's what all the kids in the neighborhood did, so you play. But football, baseball, uh, wrestling, soccer, basketball, whatever, whatever. Whatever ball we had, we're playing. Yeah. When did you turn the corner when you said, I'm a football guy. I mean, you may have played all sports, but when yeah. did you turn that corner when it was, I'm all about football? In Elkhorn, football rules all. Um, I, I'm biased, but I, I think of all the public schools, I don't know that there's a, there's a stronger dynasty than Elkhorn High School. Uh, Coach Wartman won six state championships over four different decades, which mm -hmm. is incredible. Like 1989, they beat Pierce. 92, they beat Cozad or beat Lexington, excuse me. 91, they lost to Cozad. Uh, 96, they beat Crete. So growing up, I'm watching them win state title, state title, state title. Uh, 99, we beat Scotts Bluff. I was a sophomore. Uh, 2010. Um, I think they beat, that might have been Creed again. Uh, 2020, they won against Aurora. So Coach Wartman won these state titles in all these different decades. And uh, as a senior, we lost a regular season game. We're 8-0, South Sioux City's 8-0. We go up to South Sioux City, which was rare. South Sioux City was not a football, football town. Uh, but they had a really good team that year. We went up to South Sioux. They beat us, and we were, like, almost embarrassed to come home because we had lost a regular season game, which just doesn't happen at Elkhorn High School. And, and, and Coach Wortman would never make us feel like that. He was, you know, that it, it wasn't a big deal that we had lost. What are we going to learn from it? But from us, just the growing up in a town that idolizes football as much as that town does – you don't lose in the regular season. Yeah, and it's 41 years, 356 wins, mm -hmm. second all-time. So yeah. you're right. And I love the point you make. You know, the game, he never got outdated, did he? No. I mean, to win over those 41 yeah. years, championships in every yep. decade, um, says something about how he adapted. Yeah. But your story is so interesting because I was listening to you speak at a coaching clinic um, a few months ago. And you started out by saying, look, I wasn't a good football player, which I, I, I believe you're probably a pretty humble, humble yeah. guy. Better than what you're going to say you were. Yeah. But you said it was all about Coach Wortman, though, really making you feel as if you were as valuable as any player on that team. Yeah. So talk me through why he made that so special, even though maybe you didn't get as many reps in yeah. games and didn't play as much. Um, truthfully, I, I really was not a good football player. I was five foot, seven inches tall and 130 pounds. And, um, 
in a school like Elkhorn, there's there's a lot of kids that are bigger, stronger, faster. Um, but all my friends played football, and I was going to play football too. So I was I was always out. I always went to weights and stuff like that, and I felt like I worked hard. And I think Coach Wortman agreed that I worked hard, and and I knew that I was not going to be an every down guy or or even a every quarter guy. And um, Coach Wortman did a really good job, and, and I would I would guarantee he did it all 40 years that he was a football coach. He he made everybody feel important, and I, I remember vividly uh, we're getting ready for. Our first game as a senior, um, it's maybe like the Tuesday or Wednesday of, of that opening night week. And Coach Wortman brings us all together at the end of practice and says, you know, guys, I, I don't know if Mark McLaughlin's going to be the starting quarterback this year. Um, spoiler alert, everybody knew I was not going to be the. But um, he said, I don't know if Mark McLaughlin's going to be the starting quarterback this year, but I'll tell you what, he's a leader. And... Um, if, if we have to go to the second or third string, he'll be ready. And he's right. I, w- I would have been ready. We wouldn't have been nearly as good, but I would have known the plays and I would have executed them as best I could. Uh, but when little things like that, I think those, that, that little bit of, of him showing, uh, Hey, I trust this kid, mm-hmm. or I know this kid's done the work. He's, he's not as good as these other guys, but he still matters to me. Those things keep kids out. And I think they the, the Wednesday in, in October when it's 12 degrees outside and you don't want to go to practice, you go to practice because of things like that. And of all the things Coach Wartman taught, that's, that's number one for me is – uh, the state championship medal that I have from our sophomore season, Bo Bump and Jared Van Ann and Brian Clark and those guys, 10 times better football players than me, but their medal looks the exact same as mine. Yeah. And those are those are things that I hope the kids in our program feel because uh, I try to I try to value those kids the same as we do the the Jared Keels and the Ezra Stewarts and the guys that that I have right now that are showing up on Friday night. I got to imagine because you are a very generous guy with your words. Have you had an opportunity to tell Coach Wartman? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I see him once in a while. Him and and Coach Backus, um, who's a legend also, those two guys, and any chance I get to tell them how how impactful they've been, I definitely do. And they're – I'm sure they've heard it a million times from a million different kids, but – uh, what those two guys have done for the community of Elkhorn and the kids that have come through it is you truly cannot measure it because, like, Dan Feichert is the head coach at Elkhorn. Now he played for Coach Wartman. Adam Stutz is the head basketball coach at Syracuse High School right now. He played for Coach Wartman. Uh, Spencer Peterson was the head basketball coach at Elkhorn, uh, Elkhorn High, and then he was an assistant at Elkhorn North. Um, he is right now. He was at Bennington for a little while. Like, I'm at Platteview. I was in Gibbon. You have these guys, these 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 kids that played for them and have gone to these different communities now. And um, I don't know that they'll ever realize the full magnitude of and outreach that they have because what they've taught is being taught through us now to these different communities. Well said. And I got to tell you, we're going to talk about your career because I'm sure uh, his fingerprints all over. Yeah. Uh, some of the successes you've had as well. But you not only got to play in the heyday, I guess the heyday lasted, you know, 41 yeah. years and continues on, but you got to play with some great players. And and, and a guy that not only was there Phil Peets, but then you play with Jay Moore. Yep. And Jay Moore goes on to be a great player at Nebraska and, of course, for the San Francisco 49ers. But he was a running back at Elkhorn, right? He was. I think D he in was. Nebraska. He, yeah, he played D end at yeah, Nebraska. Yeah. And he but was running a, back in high school. He was a running, well, all of Elkhorn kids play two ways. Yeah. So he was a, he was our running back and then he was a D end. And he, he got a scholarship to Nebraska after his junior year. Uh, so his senior year, he was already on full scholarship. Um, 6'4, 220 running back. I mean, it, I can tell you right now at Platteview, 6'4, 220 is tackle. That's, yeah. that's our tackle. Oh, tackle. Right? I don't care how fast <laughs> you are, you're a tackle. Um, yeah. 
But Jay was he was a special player, man. Special athlete, really humble guy. Tell um, me you never got any one on one tackle drills with him at, at any point, did you? <laughs> uh, I got tackled. I was the scout team quarterback, so I got drilled by Jay a time or two. Uh, but again, likely because of what Coach Wartman taught. I mean, Jay would hammer you at practice, but help you up, pat you on the back. And then in the locker room afterwards, it's, it's hey, thanks for doing that for us. Thanks for, thanks for being the quarterback today or just humble guys. Is it surreal, though, when you're watching him on TV play for the 49ers? Are you sitting there going, yeah. I, I can't, I just, you know, I just got drilled by this guy practice he, a few years earlier. It, it is and it isn't. Um, I mean, I remember playing Little League Baseball. And Jay Morris pitching for the other team, and you get into the batter's box, and you're just terrified he's going to drill you. <laughs> uh, but there's this sense of of this larger than life person, but there's also this sense of hey, I I remember Jay Moore came to my fourth grade birthday party. You know, it's 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 a good combination, and and uh, I think I think guys like Jay are are what make Nebraska high school football, not, not UNL, Nebraska high school football special is there's, you know, think of the kid out of Ainsworth right now, Carter Nelson out of yeah. Ainsworth. He's going to go to Georgia or Alabama or hopefully Nebraska or, or Michigan or wherever, but there's going to be kids sitting in the seat that I'm in right now telling stories about playing backyard football with Carter Nelson, just normal small town guys that do the work, have some ability um, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's a great story. And boy, the lessons you get out of Elkhorn from your legendary head coach, from guys like Jay Moore. And so you embark on a coaching career. You start out in Gibbon. Yep. And you start as a student assistant in 2006, then move into an assistant role. And for many years, Gibbon really struggled to win some games. And you get the head coaching job in yeah. 2009. I think you said they were... Program may have been one and twenty-three yep. a few years prior to you six, going seven, in. and eight. They went one and twenty-three, and I was part of that. I was an assistant, and you know, when you're twenty-two years old, you think you know everything. You think you have all the answers. And uh, in Elkhorn, you run one formation. Coach Wortman ran one formation, double tight eye, and that's it. Every now and then, we'd get fancy and move one of the tight ends out, but. So I, watching Gibbon, I'm, I'm thinking, well, that, that's the problem. They have 35 formations and a whole bunch of quantity and no quality. So, again, 22-year-old kid that knows everything. So when, I, when I'm the head coach, we're going to do it this way. We're going to go run Elkhorn's power eye, and we're going to do this and this and this. Well, good luck running slot eye or double tight eye against Gothenburg and Broken Bow and those schools when your offensive line is 160 pounds across the board. So that first year was there was a huge learning curve we won a couple games um first year as the head coach in 09 yep okay. 09 so 2008 we i think we scored 14 points all year that last year as an assistant one of them was a pick six and the other one was a double pass so we didn't score a, a traditional drive, offensive yeah. touchdown all year and I got hired in 2009 as the head coach, and, and it was very evident that number one on the agenda had to be the summer weight program. That previous year, not, not uh, total kids, total appearances, all of the kids, the amount of times that they came to the weight room, three. Where all players, your entire all players. squad was there three days the entire summer. To no, three kids. Like one kid showed up twice and another kid showed up once, three. You, yeah, you the entire you summer. Work to do that, yeah, you? <laughs> I think that was in like 2006 or 2007. Like, okay, this there's the problem. Right. So 2009, that was that was uh, kind of how we started things. And you know, I see Jared's helmet here. Those stickers on the helmet. There's a bunch of dumbbells on that helmet. That started in Gibbon. That was one of the things that came to Platteview from Gibbon is, okay, we we have to figure out a way to get kids to come to this weight room. And right. So Coach, one, it's got to be more than a sticker. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So what yeah. is it? What, what what is your plan to incentivize, motivate, inspire, uh, make them perspire to yeah. get in there in the summer? What is it? One of the things we told them was, 
lifting weights won't guarantee you a winning season, but not lifting weights will guarantee you a losing season. If you don't lift, there is zero chance we're going to win, period. So if you want to have a chance, not saying, not saying it's a guarantee, but if you want to have a chance, you have to lift. That was one. Two, we came up with this point system where they could letter without ever even coming to football practice. They could have a varsity football letter by the time we started practice by showing up to the weight room. Uh, and that got our younger kids. To me, the, the older kids come into the weight room, that wasn't going to fix it. We needed them to lift, but that's a one and done. They're going to lift, graduate, and move on. We needed our younger kids. The fix wasn't going to be a one-year thing. Right, we needed our right. younger kids to lift so that as sophomores, juniors, and seniors, they weren't already behind. So that's, that was, to me, the biggest thing, was getting our, our ninth and 10th graders in the weight room. Uh, even if they weren't going to be on the field on Friday night, they were going to letter. That was going to keep them out for football. Um, and then fortunately for me, we had a class, that 2011 graduating class, 2010 senior class, that those guys had a little chip on their shoulder. Um, they had a little swagger to them. And, you know, not, not like Miami of the 80s, not like yeah. that, but they were nasty. And those guys decided that we, we were going to be good. And if we were going to be good, that means we're going to be tough. We're going to be physical. And if guys didn't show up to the weight room, they'd drive to their house, knock on their door, and pull them out and bring them to the weight room. Um, so it was really, really a combination of several things, I think. I love it. And, you know, Coach, along that lines, my guess is that as the success came, uh, my guess is you saw a difference, too, oh, yeah. in your players, right? Those, um we took the Bill Snyder approach. So 2009 was the end of a second cycle. It was the second year of the scheduling cycle. So 2010, we're going to get a whole new schedule. And we, we submit our wish list of non-district request games, and we put down anybody that we thought we could beat, uh, which that's the Bill Snyder approach. If you remember, Kansas State used to play patty cake after patty cake after patty cake. Yeah. We tried to find, like, we went to Ainsworth, um, which was three hours away, and that's not disrespect to Ainsworth. I called Ainsworth's coach. He and I talked. Hey, one of us is going to win if we play each other. Mm -hmm. And we both thought, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Uh, we called uh, Lincoln Lutheran. At the time, Lincoln Lutheran wasn't great. And, yep, let's play. So we went all over the state that year trying to find – a game that we could win. Well, we get hot early. And I think at one point we're four and one. And like you said, you win one. Okay. That's great. Then we won two. And one of the games we won was against Kozad, which at the time was the huge deal. Kozad yeah. was, Kozad's won state titles. And, and uh, it was before Kozad, I think Kozad beat Ashland in the state championship game a couple, that's right. couple that's years right. later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was prior to that. But Kozad had a little bit of a history. Um, beating Ainsworth was, was one thing. Beating Kozad was another. You know, you go out to their stadium and see 1991 state champions, and you beat them. Well, so now you got kids that believe. And, and then we beat Central City. And then uh, best thing that happened to us that year is we're 3-0, and and Sandy Creek comes to town. Sandy Creek wasn't very good. And we did not play well. We turned it over. Uh, our guys went through the motion, and it was a little bit of coming back down to earth. Yeah. Man, we're not we're not unbeatable, guys. So we lose that game, and we're three and one. Best thing that could have happened because uh, we had to re refocus and and realize that some of the wins we had were nice, but we're not good enough to just show up on Friday night. Yeah. Um, so we that that got us back to to practicing with a purpose and stuff like that. So here you go on this run uh, again. Hadn't had a lot of success, and then from 2010 to you leave, and in nine years, five playoff appearances. Yeah. Uh, so clearly you got them in the weight room. Yep. Uh, clearly you got them incentivized to do some things. If there's anything else that you look back on and said, this was my roadmap back in 2009 when I got hired. I had to accomplish this in order for us to turn the corner. Give me one more thing that played a key role in getting that program turned around. I think leaving Gibbon 
was the most excruciating thing ever because I just felt dirty. Like, and, and the reason I bring that up is the answer to your question, in my opinion, is there's no, you, you have to genuinely love the kids that you have and the community that you're in, and they have to love you back if you're going to win games. And I think, you know, here, here in Ashland, that's coach Thompson, man. Mm -hmm. They love him mm -hmm. here and he loves this place. Yeah. Uh, I felt like in Gibbon, I would have stayed there forever if I was a single guy or if my family was from there. Um, my wife is from Syracuse and I'm from Elkhorn. Well, Springfield is dead in the middle. Yeah. So when the Springfield job opened, my wife in fewer words said, you need to apply for this. And so I did, but, uh, you know, in Gibbon, you, you go to Quinceañeras and you go to a kid invites you to their graduation party. You go when you're asked to be the host couple of a wedding, you do it. When, um, when there's a basketball game, you go to it. When there's a wrestling meet, you go to it. When the youth team is playing football in town, you go to it. And you don't go to it because it's your job. You go to it because that's the future of your program or the past of your program. And I think after three or four years, people realized that the things that I was saying or doing wasn't lip service. It was, I, I do love this place. And so, that place, I think, loved me back. And that helped. That helped build. Yeah, and I stepped on you, and, and that was an important comment that you made. So it sounds to me like it was family. It was. It, that, that word gets thrown around all the time in football, and I, we never said that word. We never said, hey, this is a family. It's, it, it was, uh, we talked a lot about what it means to wear the buffalo. Um, and and in in one sense, that's saying family. It's the Buffalo family. But I never use that word. The kids never use that word. We talked about what it means to wear the Buffalo and what it means to represent the guy that wore that jersey number before you did. Um, those are the things to me that you, within a program, like the guy that wears number 13 next year at Platteview or the guy that wears 26, Eli Van Meter's number in Gibbon. You put that jersey on, there's there's an unwritten rule that says you better be a dude, mm -hmm. and you better live up to the expectation that that guy, that previous guy had, um, and that's to me that that was the we had that rolling in Gibbon by the time I was done. Yeah, and that's that's an incredible legacy. And you know, I heard you also say. And you started to talk about it today at that coach's clinic that you felt dirty. And you, you explained it in your coaching clinic. You felt dirty because you were talking to another program, right? Yeah. And you felt like you had given, you know, your word in some ways, right, yep. to these given players. So walk me through that decision and how you worked through kind of that, that moral yeah. challenge that you, you were uh, facing. So that's a really good question. Um, I always felt like if you're going to build a program, you have to be married to it. Uh, meaning it's, it's part of everything you do. Like right now, my, my kids come hang out at practice sometimes and just watch. And we go to all the graduation parties because the kids can't wait to see them. The, the, the program is part of who you are. It's part of your everyday life. Uh, you have to be true to it. You can't lie to it. And in return, the program's not going to lie to you either. The kids in it are going to be honest with you. They're going to be truthful. They're going to be faithful. They're not going to. They're not going to do you dirty either. Yeah. Um, and I felt like when it, when we left, uh, I always told Meredith, interview Meredith's my wife, interviewing for another job is cheating on your program. It it would be like if if I went out to dinner with another woman to see if we were a good fit for each other. I would expect Meredith would be livid and vice versa. If she did that with a, with a guy, I would be livid. I can guarantee you she would be. Cut, yeah. So. <laughs> and that's, that's essentially what a job interview is. When you go interview somewhere else, you're, you're cheating on your program. So unless you're truthful with the kids in it and the administration and stuff like that, I think you're cheating. And uh, I think most, most coaches, 
if you're using a, a job as a stepping stone, you're going to be here for a couple years and then move on. Uh, are you really married to it or are you using it? And to me, you, you can probably win places using a program and moving on, but I, I don't believe in that. I mm -hmm. think like uh, Platteview, I'll stay at Platteview as long as they're going to have me. And if they ever decide that we're not a good fit anymore, that's fine. That's on them, not me. I'm not the one who, who is bailing. But uh, the, the long story short is we're in Syracuse, Meredith and I are for Christmas, and we're driving to Elkhorn down Highway 50, and we drive past the Casey's on Highway 50, and Meredith said to me, hey, you know this, this job's open, right? I said, yeah, how do, how do you know it's open? She said, I know. I just know things and you don't have to apply for it. But if you don't, you need to be honest with me and tell me you're never bringing me home, which the coaches would understand this. Coaches' wives don't ask for anything. Mm -hmm. They just roll with the punches. But every now and then they'll drop a hint. Well, that, that was a pretty strong hint. Meredith wanted to come home. We have two young boys. Our families are in Syracuse and Elkhorn. It just made sense. So I applied got the job and that was in january so coach steer the guy before me had taken a job at the fbi um so they're advertising this job in the middle of the school year i applied got it which was great i knew i had a job but the worst part was i had to go home to gibbon for five months and look those kids in the eye and tell them that i was leaving and it had nothing to do with them it, it wasn't that they weren't enough or that the community wasn't enough. It was something that was out of their control. It, my family was here. My wife has done everything to support me and it was time for me to do something that supported what she wanted. And, and all you can do at that point is hope that the lessons you've taught the kids in Gibbon about valuing family and valuing the people you love and doing the things that people you love ask you to do you hope that they understand me taking this job in Platteview was exactly that. It was, it was nothing against them. It was serving someone that served me for so long. Mm -hmm. And I have to imagine, I mean, with your approach, it was so honorable. My guess is those kids probably did understand. And it takes you now to Platteview in 2019. And you've turned into... I'm going to just use this term, my term, not yours, but a little bit of a turnaround artist because in 2019, you don't, don't have a lot of, of, of state appearances prior to you getting there and then it takes you a couple of years, but last year yeah. you go to state. So when you're evaluating the program, walking in, again, what are your priorities that you got right in 2019 to say this is what we need to start doing to get to the results that we want? When I interviewed... Uh, prior to interviewing, I got on, did a little research about Platteview, and I knew a little bit about it because Elkhorn used to play Platteview all the time. Platteview used to be in the Eastern Midlands Conference, right. which is where Elkhorn was. So I knew, I knew Platteview. But uh, you, you take a quick glance on max preps, and you don't just look at football. You look at basketball, and you look at soccer, and you look at baseball. And there's, there's very few names that are showing up on multiple rosters. They're all showing up on one roster or two rosters. Um, in fact, the first year that I was at, at Platteview, uh, the, the, the senior class prior year, there's only two or three kids in that senior class that played football and basketball. Well, that's not very good. That's, you know, you go door to door in, in Wahoo, or in Ashland, and to me, those are the those are the communities we need to compare to now. That's at the time we were Capital Conference, and Wahoo and Ashland are are in that conference, and we're trying to figure out how are we going to compete with Wahoo and Ashland and Arlington and um, and these these powerhouse athletic programs. Well, you compete with them by having your best kids play multiple sports, not one, and. That was that was battle number one was getting, uh, getting the maybe they wouldn't they weren't going to be the best football player but they were going to be one of our eleven, getting that kid to come out. So how'd you do it? How did you go to these guys that were specializing in just football, and say, look, you need to think about basketball, wrestling, track, that, baseball. That took a that took a little bit. Um, 
that first summer we moved, uh, we moved right in May. So I was here in May, uh, and I went to every Legion baseball game that summer and saw the Legion kids, but you also see the kids in the stands and you get a chance to get to know them a little bit and you go to weights and stuff. And, uh, we got a few kids that year, the, the, probably the most important recruit we got that year was a kid named Alex Draper. Um, was not, he was a basketball and a baseball player and football was his third sport. Going to be a freshman. And everybody had said, Oh, there's no way you'll get Alex Draper. There's no way. Well, we got him. He came out. He was probably our second best offensive player that year. Um, but getting him out as a freshman, if you don't get him as a freshman, you probably don't get him as a sophomore and you probably don't get him as a junior or a senior. Well, we got him as a freshman. And so because we got him at a freshman, we got him for multiple years. Um, and again, similar to Gibbon, you can go in and focus on the older players right now, but that's a one and done. You're going to have them for one year. To me, when you come in, you, you obviously coach everybody but in terms of a building process, that's done with the freshmen and sophomores and eighth graders because those are the kids you're going to have uh, for multiple years. So most of our recruiting in-house was done with the younger players. So start those conversations. If there's a coach out there that's, that's looking at this and saying, hey, I'm in similar shoes. I need, mm -hmm. to, need to get this program either winning more or just to start winning. Get them out for multiple sports and, and, and put your recruiting hat on. It yeah. sounds like you were recruiting for other coaches as well. Yeah. And, and also maybe getting that, that athlete who was out for other sports but not football. Correct. And to clarify, when we say recruiting, I'm talking within Platteview High School. Like right, right, we're, right. we're not going to Papillion or, you know, the, the kids we have in our halls. But I guess uh, to me the best comparison would be this, the seniors that are not out for football that you want them to be, that's that's today's transfer portal, essentially. That's the, the JUCO kid or the kid that's transferring in college that you're going to get for one year. Will he help you? Yeah. But he's a, he's a short-term fix. Um, you're not going to have the relationship that you have with the younger kids that you're going to coach for four years. So there's, there's two different pots you're trying to recruit. You need the, some of those kids. You need mature bodies. But I think your, your long-term sustainability is going to be the 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade kids getting them out. So when you lay a plan out, and you're going into Platteview years ago, 2019, you've got some ideas of what you want to do. One was yep. getting into do more sports. But the other thing is there are sometimes things that don't work. Yeah. That you laid in your master plan yeah. and you're like, we didn't execute this or we didn't think about this as being part of the plan. What didn't work for you when you look back on it? Um, one of the things that I don't think I, I fully understood was Platteview had, had this long-standing history of successful basketball. Um, and Coach Brodsky was was never one of those guys that told kids not to play football. Um, and and I never told guys not to play basketball. But that's that's really hard to undo in a year. Like to to get kids to to give something a football's hard because it's before. It's before basketball. It's easier to get a basketball kid or a wrestler that's really good at wrestling to go out for something in the spring because basketball is over and they can't get hurt for basketball now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Getting a kid that's a winner specialist, for lack of a better word, their best sport is winter. Getting them to go out for something in the fall is a lot harder because the risk might mean I'm not going to get to play my winter sport. Or even if your best sport is track or baseball, getting a kid to go out for something in the winter is really hard because their best sport is next. Uh, there were some basketball kids. I, I use that term loosely. Some kids that were really good basketball players that I thought maybe we can get this kid. And like Connor Milliken was a great one. Connor Milliken was a phenomenal that. basketball yeah. player. And his brother was one of my best players in 2019. So I thought, well, I bet we can get Connor. We could get Connor to play. Um, there are some kids that it doesn't make sense for Connor Milliken 
to play football. I would love to have him, but Connor Milliken was the best Class B basketball player, arguably, of all time. Do you, do you risk that if you're Connor? Probably not. And I don't blame him for that. Connor, Connor and I had the same conversation every fall, every summer, really. Hey, if you want to play, we'd love to have you. I'm not going to chase you around and recruit you. Just know that me not chasing you around and recruiting you doesn't mean I don't want you. I also don't want to be the guy that every time you see me, you got to duck into the hall. And, you know, <laughs> that was something I don't think I really – we didn't have kids like that in Gibbon. There was no, there was no, oh man, this dude's a dude at basketball. There wasn't anybody like that, that you, you try to get, but so that was, that was something I probably failed at. Um, and what you're saying is, is that you failed at maybe going after players that didn't, you know, maybe didn't make sense to right, play. Right. Right. And, and putting your efforts elsewhere yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, so you've developed a culture. Obviously, in three years, you get the program to a state yeah. playoff. How would you describe your culture? Uh, first, I, w- I would I would back up a little bit. I, I don't know I don't know how much the the head coach matters in in that in in developing culture. I think I think high school football programs can be a lot like like United States government. Like the president's important, but the president can't get a lot done without the Senate, without the House. Congress has to be on board or nothing's getting accomplished. Uh football's a lot like that. I think, you know, the guy the class that just graduated was instrumental in everything, every success we've had. Um without those guys, we don't go to the playoffs. And whatever successes we have next year are largely because of the, the culture that this class built. And, and when, I, when I say this class, it's, this is the first class that's had the same coach for four years. Uh, Adam Keel, myself, uh, Brooks Earhart, Nick Smith, um, Jordan Bald, those guys, Dave Jennings, we've had the same staff for four years those guys played under us they knew the expectations and we didn't have to do anything they just knew they'd been taught as freshmen and sophomores this is the expectation and then they went and enforced it and replacing guys like that that's we just had our player meeting the other day and that was one of the things I told the the current ninth through 11th graders is you know, you, nobody in here has to go be Ezra Stewart on the football field. Nobody in here has to go be Jared Keel or Leo Gunther on the football field. Someone in here has to go be Jared Keel in the classroom. Somebody here has to go be Ezra Stewart in the weight room. Somebody here has to go be Leo Gunther. Same, same type of thing. You know, we, we need guys that when somebody doesn't show up to weights, you go get them. That's not McLaughlin's problem. That's your problem. Yeah. You go get them. Um, that's... To me, the, the, the senior class, much like that 2010 class in Gibbon, uh, this class here, 2023 class at Platteview, we owe a lot to them. Yeah, I was just going to say there's so many similarities between those two groups yeah. uh, after hearing you talk today. Well, we're going to do some how-tos because we've got okay. coaches out there that tune in to, to learn. And so we're going to throw a few questions out there that if those coaches are like, again, how could I do this? How could I use social media, for instance, as an example, to help build my program? So let's start there. Okay. Uh, Are you a social media guy? And do you believe there's a place in social media that can help coaches build programs? I do. Um, I don't do Snapchat or, or any, I do Twitter. Twitter's my thing. Um, Now I, I do think Snapchat and, and some of those are good for, like in Gibbon, there was a lot of kids that don't have a cell phone. They don't have, or they'd have a track phone where the, you could go to Walmart and buy a phone for 20 bucks and you get X amount of minutes and messages. And then once they're gone, they're gone. And then they'd go pay $20 and get a new one. So their phone number was always changing. Well, with, with Snapchat or, or Instagram or whatever, that, that handle or that contact never changes. So mm-hmm. that was one of the easiest ways for me to get a hold of kids uh, was through forms of of communication like that now in some districts that's frowned upon they they don't want you 
to me, the argument to that is no, no superintendent or board of education is going to tell me that using those things is, is wrong because the very first day of school, those same people stand in front of you and talk about the importance of a relationship with kids. Uh, if those kids and I have a relationship that is trusting enough for us to communicate, that's a very, very good thing. As a professional, they need to trust my judgment that right. I'm going to communicate appropriately with them. Um, so there's there's that avenue of social media. But for me, uh, Twitter, you know, we we put little hype videos up. You know, we're 72 days till game day or whatever. Uh, we we post weight room accomplishments. Um, we post postseason awards. Uh, I don't post like starting lineups or anything, but. Uh, a lot of information. Hey, parent meeting at this time for summer lifters. And uh, hey, the bus is going to leave for Fall City at this time. Hey, when we go out to Adam Central for the playoffs, the fire truck's going to lead us down Main Street. We post a lot of that stuff on Twitter uh, for communication type purposes. It's an easy way to spread the word without inconveniencing people. Because uh, they can read it when it's convenient for them. They choose when they get on social media as opposed to a, an email or something like that. They don't choose when that email comes to them. It comes to them, and most people open it right then and there. Yeah, well, so you've got a great communication channel through it as well. All right, I'm going to take you back in time. Kay. You might be too young to remember this, but you remember when Sir Charles Barkley said in that famous or infamous, whatever, whatever way you look at it, that Nike television ad, I'm not a role model. You may remember that. Do you believe that there's an inherent responsibility of coaches and athletes within the high school to be that role model? Or are you of the, uh, of the opinion of Sir Charles who said, no, we're not role models? What are your thoughts? I, I think absolutely you are, whether, whether you chose to be or not. When you, when you put on that Trojan head or you embrace the buffalo that I talked about earlier, that's – the duties that come with that, if you want the glory, there's some responsibility that comes with it. And one of the responsibilities is you have to at all times remember that little eyes are on you. And I don't always do the great, the best job of that. Sometimes I, you know, I, I think about our homecoming game against Ron Colley. I didn't agree with a, a pass interference call and I was pretty upset. Um, my little guys, when I got home, my little boy, Brooks, Brooks is 10, told me about it. You know, you always told us that we shouldn't yell at the referee. You're right, Brooks, I did, and I, I messed up. Um, Look I, at I this, your 10-year-old holding you accountable. Exactly. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that role models have to be perfect. I think you can still make mistakes like I did. Um, but I think role models need to be accountable afterwards. They need to publicly say, I messed up. Um, and one of the things that I think our, our society struggles with right now is sometimes athletes mess up and that's it. They get no, ch they get no second chance, whether they apologize for it or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, whether it's a, an insensitive tweet or, a um, uh, speeding crime or you know the the georgia guy the georgia d tackle right now there's people that think the eagles shouldn't have drafted him because he was driving too fast and unfortunately there was there was some casualties but i think as a society uh we we do need to hold athletes and coaches to a, a standard um but i also think we need to show a little grace and empathy empathy too because they're it, asking people to be perfect is it's not reasonable. Well, look, I know I, I had a feeling you were going to say that because you had a pretty big influence in your life. A guy named Patrick uh, Broccoli, right? Yeah. Running back 5'8", 140 pounds when you were a little guy. Yep. And so he was such a huge role model for you. Walk, walk us through that story about uh, Patrick uh, Broccoli. I'm seven years old, 1991. Um, actually, I was six. Uh, I hadn't quite turned seven yet. Elkhorn's playing, and, and they have a running back, Patrick Broccoli, who's a little guy, 5'8", 140 maybe. Um, turns out to be one of Bobby Mills' 1,000-yard rushers. Um, incredible football player. 
And at, at the time, Elkhorn played at the middle school. And, and at the end of the games and at halftime, the players would run up the steps and go into the middle school. The, the field was down in a bowl. So all of us would go over and stand on the steps and slap their shoulder pads as they went by. And I, I thought Patrick Broccoli was just this invincible human. Um, my mom played bridge, the card game bridge, yeah. with, with, her, with Patrick's mom. So she's telling Broccoli's mom about how I idolize him or whatever. And, and Patrick Broccoli's mom probably forces him to sign these two photographs and, and give them to me. I have yeah, them. Yeah, uh, yeah, you brought them along today. They, I love this. They, these two photographs sit in my classroom right now. Two Mark, good luck in school <laughs> and sports, Patrick Broccoli. I'll take that. Um, we'll put that. I don't know if we're on a two-shot mark or not. All right. All right. Chris, thank you. And then this one just says to Mark from Patrick Broccoli. So this photo, Elkhorn had just played Mount Michael in the 1991 semis, I think. And so he's getting interviewed after the game. But those two, he signs these and sends them to me along with a letter. And I kept them forever. I'm 39 years old. I got those when I was seven, six or seven. I think I got them for Christmas that year, so I was six. And they've, they've stayed in my wall in my classroom and in my bedroom when I was a kid until now. I took them off the wall why and brought them here. Yeah, because why is that? I, I, think, I think kids that are in our program right now, that's, that's a physical example of when I tell them little eyes are watching, I'm not lying. Like, I watched this kid and he still matters to me. If I opened up the newspaper today and saw that Patrick Broccoli got a DUI, I would be devastated. I'm 39 and I would be, I would be devastated or, but I, if I opened it up and I saw, Hey, uh, uh, Patrick Broccoli, a man named Patrick Broccoli stopped a bank robbery in Hastings, Nebraska. Like you bet he did. I knew he would <laughs> right. just, he's, there's kids that have my kids at home. Um, at Platteview, we have tape on all the lockers. And it says uh, Stewart, number two, Draper, number three, Golda, number four. Uh, school got out. The seniors graduated. We peeled all the tape off those lockers. My kids asked me to bring it home so they could put it on their lockers that we have in our garage at home because they want to be just like Ethan Golda and they want to be just like Jared, Jared Keel. Uh, it's, I, don't, I don't know that you can remind high school kids enough just how much little guys want to be like them. Yeah. And there's no doubt about it. That answers the question. And even Sir Charles said later on in life, he knew he was a role model. It yeah. was a great marketing yeah. uh, event for him. It made yep. him a lot of money, that's for sure. But yep. that is the reason right there. That yep. answers the question. Um, and I imagine that's a message you give to your kids all the time. That, look, you, you got these kids that you owe responsibility yeah. to. Whether you like it or not, you know, they're looking up to you, right? Right. Yeah. They're, fortunately, these kids get it. I mean, I don't, I don't have to tell them. They know. Um, one of the best nights of the year, we do this all-access pass thing where the kids that are in our youth program or the kids that come to a summer camp that we host, they come in the locker room with us at halftime. They run out on the field with us. That's the highlight of the year. Like, our high school kids can't wait for that because those kids, the little guys run up and they pick out, oh, I'm going to run out with Ben Alexander or, oh, I'm going to run out with Reed Patera. And, you know, the, the high school guys seeing kids that, that want to be like them, man, that how, how can you possibly mess that up? Yeah. Like if that doesn't keep you in line as a human, I don't know what will. Great point, and I'll tell you, with a guy named Jared Keel, uh, this is a great transition to how we're going to finish. We finished with something called three and out. Okay. And with Jared Keel, you had very few three and outs with him, a quarterback. So you're not used to this, but we're going to yeah. get you through it. So I'm going to ask you three kind of oddball questions. First one, you are an elite D1 athlete, and you're wanted. You've got 44 offers around the country. And the most lucrative collective comes up to you and says, all right, what's your NIL deal? What do you want? What's your NIL deal that you're asking for? Mm. Something that brings the Shrine, Shriners Hospitals money. Uh, one of the 
undoubtedly not just highlights of my coaching career, highlights of my life have have been the two experiences I've had in the Nebraska Shrine Bowl. Um, and I'm I'm very fortunate. I'm going to do it again as uh, a head coach this yeah. year. Yeah. But what what the Shriners Hospitals for Children do is unbelievable. It's there's there's kids that. Um, there's a boy named Brody that we met last time. His One of his legs was six inches shorter than the other when he was born. And so the Shriners Hospital came up with this brace and essentially it screws into his leg and they turn these screws a quarter of a turn every so often and it lengthens his bone. Um, Brody's Bro- Brody can run now. His legs are the same size. Uh, whatever NIL deal I had would have some form of kickback to the Shriners hospital for children, because if, if somebody can come up with a better charity organization, I'd love to know. I don't think there is one. Yeah. What a great uh, opportunity too. And I think it's so everybody I know, you know, Ryan Thompson had a chance to be the head coach a few years back as well. The experience really, I mean, it's life affirming and, and really life changing, isn't it? It is. It's uh it's you go out it's the weirdest experience because you have 45 phenomenal high school athletes that that are blessed with unreal talent and high character um and then you see these patients that have not been dealt the same hand they've they've been they've they have a prosthetic limb or they're a burn victim or whatever whatever the case may be uh but their attitudes are awesome it's 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 humbling for every human that experiences it to see how grateful the kids are for what they do have the work ethic that they have to continue to get better and try to be like some of the football players they're going to watch in the shrine bowl Um, just an just an awesome experience that anybody that goes through it is is very fortunate to have yeah well let me tell you that d1 school that that offered you then uh, they're going to know they got a really high character guy so (laughs) with that as well um, all right, here we go. You get to travel, and you get to travel anywhere. You don't have to worry about money. You don't have to worry about how do you get there. <clears throat> you get to go anywhere you want for a week. Where are you going? Ireland. Ireland. Tell me yeah. why. I'm Irish. Uh, my wife and I went in 2011. Um, uh, my family is from Donegal, Ireland. And so we, M- Meredith and I, with another couple, went to to Ireland, and we flew in. Ireland's not very big. It's, it's, uh, it's easy to drive. So we flew into Dublin and we spent a week there and we stayed at various uh, bed and breakfasts. Ireland's kind of shaped like a potato, uh, ironically. So you you stay at these bed and breakfasts throughout. We went up into Northern Ireland and and it's awesome. I would go back in a heartbeat yeah. and I would I would when it's time to retire I would go there and live there forever. It's, any, any golf? Uh, I'm not a big golfer. Yeah. Um, I'm the worst golfer ever, but. I, what you see on TV, like the cobblestone walls on the side of roads, that's, that's happens. That's Ireland. Um, Dublin is like a a concrete jungle, but outside of Dublin, when you get into like the smaller Irish towns, it's what you see on TV, these lush green fields with old, old cobblestone walls. And it's, it's awesome. So we're going to finish with this one. Your best football movie you've ever seen. The best football movie. Oh, that's tough. Um, See, when you ask a baseball guy, there's only like four baseball movies. Yeah. So it's like one of four. But football, there's got a few more options. I mean, there, there's like when I was when I was younger, I would have told you the program, um, which. As a coach now, I don't love the program because it, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens in it. But um, I think I'd say I'd go Invincible. Invincible. I haven't even seen it. It's awesome. Okay, Invincible. That's on my list. Yep. I mentioned the other day. Uh, someone said the best quarterback movie, or the, the best quarterback in a movie. You know, a character. And I said Burt Reynolds in The Longest Yard. So the original. Okay. Have you seen that yeah. one? Oh yeah. Oh my oh, yeah. golly, that's the, that's the original is no better than the remake, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah, coach, you've been awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, obviously, 
the programs you've built, uh, what you've done at Gibbon, what you've done at Platteview, talks a lot about the kind of coach you are. But that answer regarding the NIL deal and that it would be something to give back to Shrineville, I think, is your great legacy. There's no doubt about it. Uh, your heart, heart is, is pretty special. So thank you for joining us. It's been a ball. Thank you very much for having me. Great.